the Schrodinger equation is the fundamental equation of quantum mechanics. It's the equation we're going to use to get the wave function of particles. And the wave function, as we'll see, is the object which tells us everything there is to know about a certain particle. It tells us all of its physical properties. So in this video, we're going to go into a derivation, if you can see my air quotes there, uh, of the Schrodinger equation. So we can't really derive the Schrodinger equation in the normal sense of the word. Um, usually it's taken as a postulate in quantum mechanics, meaning something that's just assumed to be true. But if we start from some other principles and assume that those, and assume a few other principles are true, we can do a, a sort of derivation in a sense of the Schrodinger equation here. So last couple of videos, we talked about the classical wave equation where we had some wave amplitude u, which is a function of space and time, and it obeyed the classical wave equation, this equation here, this second order partial differential equation. Then we saw to get the solutions of this, we can get an object which generally looks like some spatial function, which now we're going to call psi, the spatial part of the, of the wave equal psi of x times some function of time cosine omega t. So a cosine function with some angular velocity times time. Now, if we substitute in this type of equation here into the classical wave equation, we'll see the part that depends on t doesn't, doesn't get differentiated with respect to x, so we can pull that out. So we have cosine omega t and then um, we only have a function that depends on x, so this partial derivative becomes an ordinary derivative because this psi of x only depends on x. So that becomes second derivative of psi of x with respect to x. And then this equals, on the other side of here, oops, better mark, this is v squared. So marking that over here, we have 1 over v squared. And then the psi of x, the spatial part, doesn't depend on time, so we can pull that out of this time derivative. We can just have psi of x right there. And then if we do this second derivative of cosine omega t with respect to t, well, the second derivative of cosine is just minus cosine. And then since it's got this omega part in there, by the chain rule, the, each differentiation will pull out a factor of omega. So the second derivative will pull out an omega squared. So you should be able to convince yourself that this second derivative of this time part will give you minus omega squared cosine omega t. OK, then we can see that we have cosine omega t on both sides. So we can go ahead and cancel that out. So the time part is gone. So for the rest of the video, what we'll be deriving is just the spatial part of the wave equation, the spatial part of the Schrodinger equation, which is called the time-independent Schrodinger equation. We'll see how time works in the Schrodinger equation in later videos. OK, so right now we have second derivative of psi, this wave function, with respect to x. And then if we take this minus sign and then move and then move that over to the other side, add omega squared over v squared psi of x to both sides, then we'll get plus omega squared over v squared psi of x equals zero. Okay, so moving further on from there, there's some other things we know. We know that omega equals 2 pi times the fr times the frequency that's just a an standard angular quantity and then for this v squared here we know that the frequency of a wave times its wavelength equals the speed of that wave so if we take this omega squared v squared here moving forward with that the omega squared over v squared equals 4 pi squared times nu squared, the frequency squared. And then the bottom part, v squared, is going to be nu squared times lambda squared. And then these nu's are just going to cancel out. 
Okay, so now this omega squared over v squared becomes 4 pi squared over lambda squared. So moving forward with that, for this 4 pi squared over lambda squared, which is now this part of this fu function here, the part we're interested in. Well, what do we know about this wavelength? Well, if we, want, if we look at the total energy, well, uh, looking at the de Broglie wavelength that we talked about uh, several videos ago, we know that the de Broglie wavelength says that the wavelength of a particle equals Planck's constant divided by its momentum. So this 1 over lambda squared here that we're interested in, just inverting this and squaring it, we would have 1 over lambda squared equals momentum squared over Planck's constant squared. Okay, so then for momentum, we know that the total energy of a particle, if we call that E, equals its kinetic energy, which is P squared, momentum squared, over 2M, plus the potential energy acting on it at that point. So you should be able to convince yourself with sufficient algebraic manipulation that the momentum of a particle is equal to 2 times the mass, total energy minus potential energy, and all of that under a square root. So this equation here is just a rearranging of this energy expression right there. So then if we substitute in that expression for momentum up here, where we have momentum squared over h bar squared, that momentum squared then is going to become 2m e minus potential energy v of x over h squared. Okay, so then what does this equal again? Remember this equals 1 over lambda squared. But then remember also that this part that we're looking at, we first showed that it was equal to 4 pi squared over lambda squared. So what we really want for this coefficient here to replace that inside, the Schrodin inside what's going to be the Schrodinger equation here for this psi of x function, we want to multiply by that 4 pi squared on top as well. So let's do that. Let's make this 4 pi squared in the numerator. So then we're going to get a factor of 4 pi squared over here as well. Okay, but then we know something else. We also know that Planck's constant, h, equal, sorry, the reduced Planck's constant, h bar, equals Planck's constant over 2 pi. And that's convenient because we have h squared here and 4 pi squared, and 4 pi squared is just 2 pi quantity squared. So in fact, we can make this, by canceling out this 4 pi squared, we can just make this an h bar. So this whole constant here that we've been focused on, if I just make some non-obtrusive arrows down here, this is now going to end up equaling this 2m times total energy minus potential energy over h bar squared. So then rewriting this equation here and going over to the right side, we're going to have the second derivative of psi of x, the wave function, over dx squared, second derivative with respect to x, plus twice the mass of the particle times the total energy minus the potential energy over h bar squared equals zero. And then again, we're going to do a slight rearranging of this equation. And again, this is something that you should be able to convince yourself with algebraic manipulation. The steps I'm taking to get from here to here are just going to be algebra. What you end up with is minus h bar squared over 2m, mass of the particle, second derivative of psi of x, the wave function, with respect to x, plus the potential energy acting on that particle as a function of x, 
times the wave function again, equals the total energy times that wave function. So this is the form in which we normally write the Schrodinger equation, the time-independent Schrodinger equation for a one-dimensional particle. So this is the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And what we'll see is, by solving this equation for this psi of x, this wave function, we're going to get a function back which is going to give us everything we can possibly know about the properties of a particle. It'll tell us its energy, kinetic energy, average potential energy, average momentum, average position, etc. So this is actually the fundamental equation that we're going to be working with for pretty much the rest of the, this video series on quantum chemistry.